Hello again and welcome to part two of uh, this lecture on microscopy. This is a two-part series. Part one looked at the history of microscopy, a little bit of that, and then the different types of microscopy. Part two, uh, we're going to look at, as you can see here on this slide, how do we prepare specimens for light microscopy and, and uh, prepare them to, uh, to be looked at and viewed. So let's get started. A thin film of, of, of a solution of microbes on a slide is called a smear so or some microscopic preparation like in, in, in this blood smear you're looking at a preparation of blood cells so this would be a a smear across them if we were looking at bacteria we would use aseptic transfer taking it from a petri plate or taking it from a nutrient broth tube for example and smearing them on a slide a smear is usually fixed or set by heat, not always, but usually by heat, to attach the specimen to the slide and to kill the microbes. Um, if you want to look at living ones, of course, you don't do that. You just use a, a drop, put a cover slip over it, and then you can see them swimming around in their solution. Um, but if you want them to be still so that you can examine them, then you fix them by heat. They will stick to the slide. It will kill them. Um, don't heat it too much um, because if you do, you destroy the cells and then you're, you're looking at something that, that's uh, pretty much useless and, and totally unrealistic. Um, but you heat it enough that it kills them and causes them to stick to the slide. And then you can see them and observe them and, uh, and, and make, take, uh, take notes of them. So... Like I said in the first part, many specimens need to be stained. When you're using bright field illumination, the specimens really don't have much of a color. Many don't, so you have to stain them. Otherwise, you can't see them very well. You can see like a cell wall, but it kind of all blends in. So we need to stain them. Stains consist of positively charged or negatively charged ions. Now, I'll explain in a minute why that's important. Why do stains... What's the importance of having a charged particle? Well, in a basic dye, the chromophore, which is the colored ion, chroma comes from a Greek word that means colored, the chromoform is a cation, it's positively charged. And so what happens here with a basic dye, bacterial cell walls are negatively charged. So we have opposite charges here. We have a positively charged chromophore in the stain and the negatively charged cell wall. So therefore the stain is attracted to the cell wall, goes into the bacterial cell, and now the, the bacterial cell itself is stained. In an acidic dye, the chromophore is an anion, which means it's negatively charged. An acidic dye, therefore, will be repelled by the cell wall, causing the background to be stained rather than the bacterial cells. And so that's called negative staining, and the way it looks under the microscope is the bacteria look like tiny little white specks against a dark background. And through negative staining, you can see other structures. It makes them a little more obvious than doing a, a using a basic dye or using a uh, maybe what you would call a, um, a simple stain, which is just a single stain. But what happens with negative staining is some other structures become more apparent than if you used a basic dye where you were just staining the bacterial cells. A simple stain is a solution of a single basic dye. And so that stain goes into the bacterial cell, uh, and then you can, you can see the cells against a light background. So the cells look dark, the background is light. Um, probably a common one, one that you probably used if in your high school bio class at least, or college bio classes, was methylene blue. That's a basic dye, it's a simple stain. You use just methylene blue gets absorbed by the cell and then you can see the cell so that would be one um, others that we use uh, nigrosin is one um, in the gram stain you use iodine um, saffron and so there are others as well other types of simple stains that can be used but those are common ones in an intro microbiology lab a mordant is a chemical that's used to intensify the stain and it can be used to hold the stain or coat the specimen to enlarge it, so it basically enhances what you're looking at. And so the, what happens is there's a, a chemical uh, bond that occurs between the stain and the mordant, and so it, it causes the stain to become more intense. And it can uh, make different structures more apparent within a cell.
Simple stains are used to highlight the entire microorganism. If you use a mordant, then you can look at some other specific parts of the cell. And it depends on what mordant you use. There's a variety of mordants that can uh, cause a different types of stains to be intensified. So we'll look at the Gram stain. And this was one that was a staining, um, a, a staining procedure that was developed by Christian Graham in the 19th century. The Gram stain classifies bacteria into two broad categories, Gram positive and Gram negative. Gram positive bacteria tend to be killed by penicillin and detergents. Gram negative bacteria are more resistant to antibiotics because they have what's called a lipopolysaccharide in their cell walls. So when Christian Graham discovered this type of staining classification, he didn't at the time know that there were that the there was a, a, a clinical aspect to this. Ways in which we can can treat these bacteria or kill them. I mean, this was before antibiotics were ever on the scene. Um, and so the Gram stain then later was discovered that, hey, there's these Gram positive ones. We can, they can be killed by penicillin. Gram negative ones tend to be resistant to penicillin and other antibiotics. So there was a whole um, clinical side that, that was discovered as a result of, through the, the Gram staining mechanism. So this is just, it, it's an important stain that is used to differentiate them into two different types. So it's been around for quite a while and it's still being used today. So at local hospital, I take my students on a tour of the microbiology, well, the whole lab department, but when we go through the, the microbiology part of our host, the hospital lab, they have sinks that are devoted to gram stains and they're totally covered in purple stain. So even today in a hospital, the gram stain is still being used. Um, much of hospital laboratory work is being automated and computerized, um, including the microbiology lab, but there's still a human element that's, that's needed in the micro lab, and, and, and micro uh, techs are still actually using the gram stain in order to uh, identify bacteria. So what happens with the gram stain? What stains are used? Well, I have in this chart, I'm comparing gram positive cells and gram negative cells and what happens to them as you apply each different stain uh, in the process. So you start by staining them with crystal violet, which is the primary stain. And both types of cells, gram positive and gram negative, are both purple. So the purple is a positively, crystal violet is a positively charged stain it gets absorbed into any bacterial cell because the cell wall is negative. Then we add the mordant iodine. The two of them join together, the crystal violet and the iodine chemically bond together and the cells still remain purple and it's an intense purple that, that they appear. Then comes the magic ingredient, the alcohol or the acetone decolorizing agent. And so you apply alcohol or an alcohol acetone mix onto the cells, let it sit there for a few seconds, and what happens is the gram positive cells will remain purple, the gram negative cells become colorless, they lose that crystal violet iodine stain. And so they appear uh, colorless, it's gone, for reasons that I'll explain in the next chapter when we look more closely at the cell wall. Then we use a counter stain called safranin. Now the safranin is kind of a red stain, it's like a muted red stain, it's not very bright or vibrant. Um, and the, you'll notice even with the safranin, the gram positive cells still remain purple. Why is that? Because the crystal violet and the iodine the, the blend of them together, it's so intensely purple that the safranin doesn't even appear. Now that with the gram negative cells, they went colorless as a result of the alcohol wash. Then you add the safranin and so naturally they're going to appear red. So gram positive in the end appear purple. So think positive, purple. They both start with P, positive, purple. Gram negative cells, they appear red. Um, so, because they have lost the crystal violet, it's been washed out by the alcohol. Here's what they look like under the microscope. You can see the purple gram positives, much darker, and you see the red gram negatives. So this is slide as a mixture of gram positives and gram negatives. And I wanted you to see this one so you can see what they look like and compare them side by side. 
There are a couple of special stains that we use in the micro lab. There are more than these, but these are ones that we actually use in, in our in the microbiology course. Negative staining is useful for detecting capsules. Um, if a bacterial cell produces a capsule, you can see the capsule more clearly by using negative stains. And it will show the thickness of the capsule if the stain is done correctly. And if the capsule is thicker, it's harder to kill that bacterial cell because the capsule is kind of like a suit of armor around it and it makes it more resistant to antibiotics and antimicrobials. So you can see with negative staining, the background is stained darkly. The capsule receives no stain. Now there's another stain that's used in negative staining that actually stains the, the cell. So you can see the capsule is kind of like a, a thick halo around the actual uh, organelles, the, the, um, not the organelles, but the cytoplasm and the nucleic acids that are within the cell membrane. So you have capsule, light colored, and then the rest of the cell is the, is the darker specks that are inside the capsule. That's negative staining. Endospore staining uh, is used to detect the presence of endospores. Endospores are resistant to just about everything drying out, radiation, uh, chemicals, you name it, endospores tend to survive. It's like a, it's like a, a hardcore hibernation for these cells. So the nucleic acids are inside the endospore. They're still viable nucleic acids, so it's kind of like it's a resting state. The endospore can come out of its resting state uh, and then become what's called vegetative. They can start growing. Endospores can be a real problem uh, for uh, people if you consume them, and then they go into the vegetative state within the body, then they start producing toxins, and then that can be deadly in some cases. But there's a way that we can stain just the endospore because the endospore is, is different than the actual living active cell. And so we have a staining technique that can be used for endospore staining. In this case, you have to heat them to push or drive the stain into the endospores. So with staining then, what's, what's the purpose of all the staining? And there are different types here. Other than gram stain and negative stain, there's an acid fast stain, there's flagellar staining. You can stain flagella bacteria to, uh, to see the flagella. So what would be the purpose? Well, initially, to identify. Obviously, the stain enables us to identify the bacteria or to categorize them into, into gram-positive or gram-negative, for example. But in terms of a clinical aspect, because this is a mainly a clinical microbiology course, how, how is that important clinically speaking? Well, if you can identify, then you can prescribe. So you know what you're dealing with, then the correct treatment can be prescribed, the correct medication, the correct antibiotic, whatever. This then enables to the enables a a uh, practitioner then to treat whatever is is infecting the patient correctly with the correct antibiotic or with the correct medication. So staining is where it begins, and like in like I said in the hospital lab, micro is where the 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 critter is identified and then once the identification is made then the correct treatment can be prescribed so it's very important then to stain these different microbes so that you can make the correct identification um, and then be able to help the patient recover and, and get better so that's the end of this chapter chapter three this chapter on microscopy uh, just a, a shorter chapter just giving you an overview of the different types of microscopy and the different ways that we prepare specimens for uh, for use under the microscope. Hope you enjoyed this lecture and that it was of value to you and uh, thanks as always for watching.